What does it mean to be a mindful photographer, and what the heck is that doing on a channel for the tech photo guy? I think you might be interested in how mindfulness and intention and deliberateness intersects with our photography and intersects with technology. Let's get started. Howdy everyone, Aaron here from techphotoguy.com. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with David Ulrich, who has a new book out called The Mindful Photographer. And as I was just sharing with him a moment ago, I feel like as photographers, we spend a lot of time going, 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 creating, promoting, publishing. Sometimes we need to slow down and think about what we're doing. And that's hopefully what we're gonna talk about here today. So uh, David, welcome. And thank you for giving me some time to, uh, to have a conversation. Thank you, Aaron. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I'm looking forward to our chat. I got it. This is the book, you know, freshly released. Uh, I got a copy from your publisher who was nice enough to send it to me to, to check out. And I enjoyed going through it. And so, you know, I, I'm somewhat familiar with, you know, mindfulness and that sort of practice, um, you know, in general, but, you know, not everybody is. And I guess we'll start with just kind of the, that as a first point, which is, you know, what does it mean to you to be a mindful photographer? And, and why should photographers care about that? How does it matter? Well, you know, let's, um, let's first of all, try to move away from the very generic meaning of mindfulness and think <laughs> about it, partic particularly in terms of photography. Mm -hmm. In photography, we are always asked to be mindful. Mindfulness really means a, a, a dual attention, a dual awareness. I'm aware of myself, my own thoughts, my own reactions, my own sensations, but I'm also aware of what's taking place around me. And as photographers, we have to recognize that our responses to the world do not take place out there. They take mm -hmm. place in here. So we need to be attuned to the moment. And in being attuned to the moment, I'm aware of my own reactions. I'm aware of my own emotions and thoughts. And I'm attuned to the subject. So I see what is being sparked in me that causes me to snap the shutter. So I believe that mindfulness from a photographic point of view is the ability to divide our attention between the world and ourselves and be aware of that relationship. Yeah, that makes sense. And you point out in the book that when you when you capture an image of a person, a, a bridge, a landscape, whatever it is that you're photographing, um, you know, you're not just capturing that thing as it exists independent of you. You're capturing your choices that you've made, and you know, you know, really, you're putting yourself into that picture as well in various ways. Uh, and that yeah, you know that um, many people would argue, I would argue, that every photograph is both. It says something mm -hmm. about the world and it's a self-portrait. Both take place at the same time. And that's what makes photography so interesting. Right. It's, it's asking photographers to, you know, to think a little bit about what they're doing because you know, and I'm sure I'm guilty of it. I'm sure we're probably all guilty of, of it at times where we end up just kind of in maybe an autopilot mode where we approach a, a photographic situation, whether it's, you know, just, you know, a, a fun thing, kind of an impromptu thing, or whether it's a professional job, um, you know, it, it, we get into that mode where it's like, okay, I'm going to make a headshot or I'm going to capture this landscape or whatever the situation may be. And we just, we just kind of do it. You know, we, we know what we need to know about settings or light or things like that. And we just do it. But, um, you know, does being a mindful photographer require you to slow down and spend more time thinking, or do you think you can get to a point where being mindful becomes second nature? Well, being mindful has nothing to do with the tempo. You know, a street photographer is in the mm -hmm. middle of chaos and they can be mindful. Right. A landscape photographer is more contemplative. Here's where I see the problem. Um, we have so many images in our heads. You know, we look at so many images on a daily basis in publications, websites, social media. And at the same time, we have our own authentic vision. People really need to work through that backlog of images 
they carry in their brain. I can tell by the second or third photography class when I'm teaching a class whose pictures, which pictures belong to which person. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a particular way of seeing. The problem is most people are not aware of their own way of seeing. I find it really odd that we have grown to adulthood without understanding how we see. And I think that's the first step is, you know, when we go out taking pictures, what are we taking pictures of? Is mm -hmm. it something that is really authentic to who we are, to how we see the world? Or is it merely digesting and even unconsciously imitating the backlog of images we carry in our brains? Yeah, and I think that's interesting, you know, that you point out where, you know, others can sometimes see that when we can't see it ourselves. And, we, you know, two other things popped right into my head that, you know, are kind of related things in the world. You know, one is that, and this can apply to photography as well, is that, you know, often people don't consciously develop a style, you know, maybe for their photography to use a term that we often hear, you know, but others will then point out, oh, their style is such and such, you know, whether that was what the person was going for or not, you know, and I also think similar to branding, right, you know, we can put a logo or a color scheme or messaging out into the world that we say we want to be our brand. Um, but Jeff Bezos has a quote where he says, you know, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. It's like, you know, <laughs> and well, you know, students ask me, you know, do I have a style? Do I have a color sense? I said, all you have to do is open your closet. Look <laughs> at the clothes you wear. I mean, everybody, right. you know, has a natural style. We don't need to create a style. We uncover a style based on who we are. Right. And that's interesting, you know. Sometimes I have discussions with photographers or as we talk about aspects of their work, um, you know, or occasionally I will I'll judge uh, formal image competitions such as those done by the Professional Photographers of America and occasionally get into a discussion with a photographer and they talk about, oh, well, here's how I approach my personal work and here's how I approach my professional work. Is, is there really a difference? Can there be a difference? Or do you feel like a photographer really just has a way that they approach their photography and you know trying to separate it is is artificial. <clears throat> There's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. We 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 do have a natural style and that comes through everything we do. But there's a big, there's a huge difference between personal work and commercial work. When I'm doing personal work, I am fulfilling my own mission, what I want to do. When I'm doing commercial work, I'm fulfilling the needs of a client. So one needs to be a little more transparent when you're doing commercial work mm -hmm. because the, the vision, the, what the client wants is uppermost. But your natural style, I believe, will translate into whatever you do, personal, commercial, editorial, portrait, et cetera. You know, I think the biggest problem is because there's so many images out there, we need to get beyond cliches. Uh, most of my students, the first things I see of them are very cliche written. And over time, they learn to let go of that. I, I see my first job as a photography teacher is to break down what I would call the popular photography aesthetic <laughs> and to lead students to something more authentic. Right. And in the book, you talked about how as photographers, especially as modern photographers, kind of in our fast paced social media fueled, you know, world, we don't always slow down and finish our work. It sounds like, you know, a lot of times we, we share things that really, you know, maybe haven't been completed or haven't been fully thought through. Um, you know, do you, Talk a little bit about maybe what it means to you for a photographer to, you know, to, to finish a piece of work or a body of work and get that to a point where it's settled and, and ready to share with the world in its final state. Well, there's two things that come into play here. The first is I have many, many students who are marvelously creative. Children are marvelously creative, but they never have the rigor 
to finish their projects. So having a certain discipline is important. The second thing that I think is important is many beginning photographers will approach a scene, they'll take three pictures and they'll walk away. A professional photographer is given a job. Let's say this job takes a morning. He or she will shoot 30 rolls of film. Why would a professional shoot 30 rolls of film and an amateur take three pictures? Because a professional photographer knows that they don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't know which moments are going to be alive. So they will work into the moment. If you watch a baseball game, a, a pitcher would never go out on the mound without warming up first. Mm -hmm. You have to warm up. You have to have foreplay. You have to have um, engagement. So for a photographer to come into a deeper engagement with the subject, which is where magic happens, they need to shoot some pictures. They need to spend time with the subject. Paul Strand, the great documentary photographer who did books on places, would live in a place for a year before he unpacked his cameras. In our peripatetic culture, we feel that something is wrong if we don't get a good picture in the first five minutes. <laughs> So I think, you know, taking more pictures, learning to engage the subject, working into the heat of the moment is important. But then also, if you have a project that's meaningful to you, discipline is a cruel world, cruel word. None of us like it. Mm -hmm. but it. But it is important to have the rigor and the discipline to follow through. And, and you can't just take a picture, post it on social media, and call it a day. I mean, right. many times, many times, the greatest pictures arise out of long-term exploration. They arise out of projects, not out of one-off pictures. Does right. that make and sense? It does. And I feel like that concept of long-term projects is one that you know, many newer photographers know, either won't understand or will misunderstand or not understand the value in. Uh, and yet when you talk to a, you know, a, an accomplished longer, you know, photographer who's been doing it for a while, they will always talk about how they have usually several long-term projects in mind and things like that. Um, and several going on at the same time. Right, right. Several, yeah. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I, I know right now it's like I could, any number of things where I've been collecting images for, for years that eventually will form, you know, a, a body of work in some way. Yes. Yes. In the book, you talk about social media a bit. You talk about Instagram specifically because it is, you know, obviously the most popular photo, photo social network that, you know, pretty much all of us are on. It seems like, um, what do you see as being, you know, and you touched a little bit on maybe some of the downsides of Instagram, but I know you also talked about there, there are some upsides to having that readily available to you. How do you think photographers can use, can use Instagram in a way that, um, you know, helps them grow, um, you know, in a, in a long-term positive direction? Well, I grew up in the analog era. You know, we had to go to libraries and look at books. We had to go to museums and look at prints on a wall. And what's remarkable about Instagram and Facebook and other social media platforms, they are publishing platforms mm -hmm. with a global reach. So you have the ability to put your work out there in a global arena. That's huge. That is a hugely positive thing. Now, the question is, what are you going to put out there? Are you dominated by your ego and you're taking cute little selfies? Or are you looking around your community and thinking, what is it here that needs to be documented? Imagine, imagine if everybody in the world used Instagram and documented instances of environmental degradation in their own communities. That would make a huge difference mm -hmm. to public awareness. So I am impressed with the global reach of social media and the potential for an amazing amount of good to come out of it. 
But I think people have to get beyond the narcissism and the, you know, the self-absorption and think about what is it they want to document. Right. Yeah. We, we all have that, that little bit of vanity or ego and we love that quick dopamine hit from the likes we and the do. comments that come in. We do. And, we do. You know, and that's, it's great for a short term, you know, for that short term hit, but, uh, but doesn't necessarily contribute to any sort of long-term growth for us as photographers or for, or for the world that we live in. Um, you know, and it, you touched on something there a moment ago that is also something you mentioned several times in the book, which is, you know, as photographers, we have the, you know, we have the ability to capture images that showcase our world for better or for worse <laughs> in, in the state that we find it in. And in the choices of what we choose to capture and share, you know, we have the ability to influence the, the future of that world. There's, you know, there are definitely some themes throughout the book where, you know, you note, you know, environmental causes or, you know, social justice type causes where, you know, we have the ability to make a difference. Talk a little bit about, you know, why is that so important as photographers? And, you know, are we, you know, are we doing ourselves and our society a disservice if that's not something we actively seek out? If we just like to make headshots or if we like to do commercial work or we like to take landscape photos, maybe? Well, I think we have an incredibly powerful tool in our pocket in the form of a camera. And of course, we should use it for our enjoyment. I, I find great fulfillment in using a camera. I love it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a powerful tool for social change. Um, look at the issue of diversity. Um, in my community, which is Hawaii, it's one of, the, one of the most diverse communities in the world. And the New York Times did a uh, photo essay. If you wanna be less, less racist, move to Hawaii. <laughs> And it was marvelous. It was a group of portraits of the diverse population that is part of Hawaii. And it made a statement. It made a statement that character is not based on skin color. In fact, you cannot judge someone's ethnicity in Hawaii by looking at them because there's been so much intermarriage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so those pictures made a profound point, a point that couldn't just be made in words. Now, my only criticism of that essay is why did the New York Times bring a photojournalist from New York to Hawaii? <laughs> why wasn't this project done within Hawaii, so to speak? <laughs> right, because certainly there are many I'm sure there are many, many photographers in Hawaii, you know, yourself included, uh, you know, that are quite capable of having captured those sort of images. And right, right. And there's an authenticity that comes when it's somebody from within a community, you know, whatever that community may be, whether we're talking a, you know, a, a location, a race, gender, a, you know, some sort of demographic group, you know, the, you know, you're going to get a different view on it, whether it's somebody from within that group or whether it's somebody from the outside, you know, looking in through their lens. And, right. you know, and that's another area where I feel like as photographers, you know, we all can do a better job of making sure that, you know, through our work, you know, but also through other things as we go to, you know, if we're involved with photo organizations and conferences and publications, you know, ensuring that diverse voices get represented from a variety of backgrounds, right? You know, I'm a, you know, I'm a white, you know, white guy born in mid middle-class U.S., right? I have a whole lot of privilege, you know, you're raising your hand as well, right? You know, we, we've been fortunate yeah, yeah. that, you know, in general, yeah. our, our identities haven't been, um, you know, at least our visible identities haven't been a big factor in, you know, any sort of adversity that we've had. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of people where that's not the case. And, you know, the more we can do to recognize that and ensure that those voices are at the table as well, the better. 
You know, Sarah, Sarah Lewis, the art historian at Harvard, uses a phrase called representational justice. Mm. You know, seeking that kind of diversity in exhibitions, in books, in teaching jobs is, is really important today. And I had a student that did a project in the college where I teach uh, on racism on the campus. Mm-hmm. And it was fascinating. It, it, it showed that there was, in fact, racism on the campus where I teach. And it taught us all something. So, you know, there's an old adage, a picture can say a thousand words. I think that's true. And I would say to photographers, you know, do your selfies, do your sunsets, do everything that you find exciting. But also think about in what particular sub-community are you? And, and how could the camera be used to further the social good? Yeah, I, I think that's important. And I think it's a, you know, it's a key point because you know, we're, all, we're all making choices, you know, consciously or subconsciously in what, how we use our cameras, what we photograph, what we share, who we share it with. Um, you know, just applying a little bit of intention to that <laughs> can go can go a long way. Absolutely, absolutely. Shifting gears a bit, one of the things that you talked about about halfway through the book, you had a you had a series of information about you know evaluating your own work, analyzing your own work, and that's something that you know I think every photographer struggles with, even. You know, even very accomplished photographers, you know, we always see our own work through our own lens, right? You know, we, it gets back to the adage that, you know, we, we judge others by, you know, their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. And I think sometimes that happens with our photography as well. And so, um, you know, not, I would encourage people to get the book and kind of go through that section and take a look at it because I found it quite, you know, quite interesting. But, you know, what are a couple things maybe you would call out on as photographers as we're looking at our work and trying to, you know, understand what we've done or what we're going for? What are maybe a couple things that you would say everybody can apply to their work in becoming more well, skillful at analyzing our own work? First of all, and I include myself here. Photographers are the worst editors of their own work. And and ironically, there's very little written material out there on editing Mm -hmm. and how to do it well. I think the first and the most important foundation for editing is making good contact sheets or having a file browser where you can see all of your pictures at once. That is huge. when I walk, I, I collect used and rare photography books. When I walk into a bookstore, I can tell intuitively whether I'm going to make a find that day. Mm-hmm. And this is going to sound really new agey, so <laughs> ignore it if you need to. <clears throat> but sometimes a shelf in the bookstore shines a little brighter than others to my intuition. And sure enough, I go to that shelf and I make a find. It's no different with editing. When we're looking at our file browser or our contact sheet, look with an unfocused eye at the whole group of pictures. Which ones jump off the page? Don't analyze, don't think, oh, I can't use that one because it doesn't follow the rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. Screw, Screw that, get out of your head and let your intuition be the guide and just quickly go through and put stars on those images that jump off the page. Secondly, have trusted friends. I have a couple of trusted friends that represent another pair of eyes. And I always show my work to those people before I'm doing an exhibit or a book just to get their feedback. Mm -hmm. And third, also important, um, William Faulkner said about writing, sometimes you have to kill your darlings. There may be a couple stunning pictures you have, but just don't fit this particular project. And what a lot of photographers try to do is they try to 
force those pictures into the project. Don't, don't go there. Mm -hmm. Let those pictures be used for something else. But make sure that every picture you have that is part of a project is germane to that project. A, a fence is only as strong as its weakest link. Whatever you do, don't put in second rate pictures. I can always tell a portfolio that's been bolstered to get 20 or 30 pictures mm -hmm. compared to a portfolio that's been edited down from 100 pictures. You want to edit your work down from 100 pictures. You don't want to try to add weaker pictures because a weak picture will bring the whole thing down. Right. So those are just a couple of tips. And one other thing, you know, the order that you put those pictures mm, in. Yeah. Sequencing is important. It's like music. You can tell when there's a note out of place in music. Likewise with a photography portfolio. Yeah, and that's and you spent a, quite a bit of time I remember in the book talking about sequencing and, you know, how to you know, you're not just telling a story with an individual image, you're telling a story by how you have chosen to present those images in what order and, you know, and such. And so I think, you know, many photographers, you know, often, you know, we get hung up on an individual frame. <laughs> you know, we look at an individual yep. frame, we look at strengths or weaknesses of that individual frame, but in many contexts, we're presenting that work as part of a series of things, whether that's in a, you know, a, a printed publication, whether that's how it's laid out on a website, whether that's, uh, you know, multiple images hanging on a wall. Um, and that's, that's an important thing that I think doesn't get talked about a lot in most of the, you know, it when doesn't, you... it, it, it needs to be talked about more. I really try to address that in teaching, but it is one of the hardest tools for students to learn. It's one of the hardest tools for all of us to learn. Right. And I feel like, you know, this is an area where I think a lot of our kind of the way that we tend to share our digital images now, they don't lend themselves to a collection as naturally. Um, no, you know, no. I mean, Instagram, yes, you can do multiple photos in an Instagram post, but that's not something that most people do. Um, you know, when you share to Facebook or Twitter or, you know, something like that, yes, you can create a gallery with multiple images, but usually people are just sharing a single photo because, you know, they know that even if they do share the gallery, only a small subset of the people are going to click through maybe and view the whole gallery. And, you know, and again, we're, we're back to that quick dopamine hit of, you know, the most impact. Well, so. it, it really raises the question um, are there social media platforms that are ideal for photographers? Mm -hmm. Instagram was at one time, right? but it is, it's no longer. And I think, unfortunately, most photographers have taken to their own website mm -hmm. as being the place where they can show collections of images. I think we need social media platforms that are not based on dopamine or advertising, mm -hmm. or you know, selling private information, because photographers really do want and need to show bodies of work, not just individual pictures. Right. And there are people that try to curate their Instagram feed, you know, to show a body of work, but it's awkward. I can't do that because what if something comes in for book promotion that I need to do on my mm -hmm. Instagram feed? that's going to get in the way of whatever set of right. pictures I've put in. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. I don't know if you're familiar. There's a, there's a new social network app service called glass that launched in uh, you're, you're nodding. Yes. And I like where they're going. It's, you know, they don't have collections of work yet. It's, it's all single images at this point, but um, it hits a few of those things you've mentioned. It's not advertising based. It's a, you know, it's a paid service. You sign up, you pay them about $30 a year to be a member. They don't sell your data. They don't sell advertising. All you do is look at photos and, you know, comment on with other photographers, but like any social media, there's an uptick period. And, you know, it's a great place for photographers to go interact with other photographers. Um, you know, 
they're choosing not to have it become a commercial platform, right? They don't want brands there. You know, it's not a place where you're going to have a company that sets up a glass account to go promote their company's products because that's not what the network is about. Uh, Yeah, let's just come onto my radar. I'm going to be paying more attention to it in the months to come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like I said, it, it's new. It started out iPhone only. They've expanded it. You can now view and interact on the web. Um, as we record this in very early June 2022, um, I believe within the month, they are planning to essentially expand it and open it up to all platforms. So whether people use Android, Windows, anything like that. Um, so yeah, keep we'll keep an eye on it and see where it goes. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful... Yeah. I'm hopeful they can get enough uptake <laughs> that it remains, you know, viable from a business standpoint. Um, because, you know, yep. even if it's amazingly awesome, if they don't get enough people on board to pay the bills, you know, it will eventually go away. So I'm hoping photographers see the value in having that, you know, having that kind of place where it's not necessarily commercial, but we can go and share and talk about and just appreciate photography. <laughs> yes, yes, I hope that. I hope the same. Yes. Yes. Good deal. One question I, I, I just had to ask you, uh, you know, and when I, I came to this section of the book, you know, so you know, as we talked about at the beginning, you know, I'm, I'm the tech photo guy, usually talking about all things digital, all things technology. Um, you know, in the book, at one point, you advocated that a photographer should learn how to become you know, competent (laughs) with both film and digital photography. What's the argument for somebody who maybe they're just now getting into photography, maybe they've been into it for 10 years, they've probably been, you know, all or mostly digital. What's the, what's the value or what will they gain by learning film photography in, in 2022 that would be maybe a skill or a perspective that they wouldn't have in a purely digital world? It's a very, very good question. Um, <clears throat> and I struggle with that question myself. Many colleges and universities still teach photography 101 in the dark room. There are some colleges and universities that are ha- having a hard time going, going digital. That's one extreme that I don't agree with. I think everybody needs to understand digital technology. But when I look at photography, I'm looking at a big field. And there are some, even many things that are best done with film cameras. Quite a number of photographers I know are still using large format film cameras. I still scan a lot of my old negatives for certain kinds of work where you're making very large prints, Mm -hmm. where you need a great deal of detail. Film is still a good choice. And the experience of being in a dark room is unparalleled. There's so much you learn from that. I feel I've been able to learn Photoshop so much more effectively because I know the dark room. All of the metaphors of Photoshop are derived from the dark room. So, you know, that has been the foundation stone. <clears throat> now, I think that going forward, digital is going to occupy a greater and greater role. But currently, um, film does have a different look than digital. Mm -hmm. And when I'm doing things that require very large prints and a high level of detail, I still prefer large format film. So the way I see photography is the right tool for the right job. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, oh, Are you a color photographer? Are you a black and white photographer? Are you film? Are you digital? I say, screw that. I'm a photographer who chooses the right tool for the right job. (laughs) Obviously, I think digital is essential, especially for anybody who wants to work professionally in the photography world, because, you know, whether you're talking portraits, commercial, you know, corporate events, any of that, you know, you have to be able to do, (laughs) to do digital, Uh, you know, film is, you know, film is optional for most of those arenas, but, you know, can still be a tool and can be a differentiator if you can create a body of work or create something where you can, you know, do something a little different than every other photographer down the street. Um, You know, the big problem that I have are people that are stuck in the film world Mm -hmm. and are unwilling to embrace digital, especially if those people are teachers. 
Students right. <laughs> absolutely need to learn digital. You can't ignore the digital revolution, nor should you try to. And right. there are many photography teachers my age, that not many, I think some, that are still stuck in the past. For, for better or for worse, photography and technology are intertwined <laughs> and the pace of change has increased and you know, it's not a case of newer always being better, but newer is always different. And usually it's different in at least some good ways. <laughs> and well, and the, the digital tools are remarkably effective. Today. Mm -hmm. uh, when Photoshop first came out, I really believed that the guys that wrote the program, I say guys because most of them were guys, right? There was more creativity in the writing of that program than anything that was done on the program in the early years. Now that's changed. I mean, many photographers are using Photoshop and Lightroom mm -hmm. as, as very powerful tools, but the tools themselves represent a remarkable level of creativity. Definitely. Yeah. They, they bring us new possibilities to do entirely new things or to make things that previously were maybe extremely difficult, you know, make them more accessible to photographers so that we can, you know, so that we can execute on that vision that we have, you know, without having to spend, you know, 15 years, maybe learning how to do something to get there. <laughs> I mean, some of the new AI tools in Photoshop are remarkable. Mm -hmm. You know, I just upgraded my system so that I could have a system that would accept the newest version of Photoshop because there's so many improvements in the program that come from AI. Mm -hmm. the, two, the two disciplines that have served photograph, uh, Photoshop remarkably are um, artificial intelligence and NASA. A lot of the tools in Photoshop were first developed by the space program. Yeah, it's it's amazing what, you know, what the AI can do. And, you know, I actually wrote a book late last year on AI and the future of photography. And it's one of those things where, you know, every photographer, I mean, unless you are working purely in film and the dark room, I mean, every photographer is benefiting from AI in different places in their current cameras, in their editing tools, in their smartphones. Um, and like any tool, if you're aware of what it can do, and you understand how it can benefit you, it can, you know, it can help, uh, you know, and like any tool, you know, it's not always the right tool for the job, <laughs> but, right, right. <clears throat> but being aware of it is, is a huge asset. So as we kind of wrap things up, I would love to just kind of say, you know, for somebody who, you know, maybe they've listened to this and they hadn't really considered some of these things, you know, they've been, you know, they've been making work, but maybe they haven't been thinking about, you know, the work that they're making or how they're making it or, you know, being, you know, being more intentional about how they do that. You know, what's, you know, what's a good, I mean, obviously I think getting your book, which I'll, I'll drop a link down below so that they can do, I think that will be a great tool for them. Um, you know, I, you know, your writing style in the book, and I think it was appropriate for this is that, you know, you ask a lot of questions, right? And, you know, and you propose some answers to some of those, but a lot of the material, you know, there's not a single right answer. It's more important, I think, for people to think about it than to, you know, take your word with a great, you know, as is. What's one thing a photographer can take away that as they go out to make some photos, you know, this weekend, or if they're going to, you know, go photograph a family member or a client or something, you know, what's a starting point? How, how does a photographer start becoming more mindful? I would say to seek, seek immersive experience. Spend some time where you really engage with your subject. Don't walk up to a scene and take two pictures and walk away. My first photography teacher once said to me, once you've taken the pictures you set out to make, now is the time to start exploring the subject. One of the assignments I used to give during the film era is take 36 pictures of the same thing. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier in the interview, but in teaching photography during the film era, statistically, frame number 36 held the largest percentage of successful photographs. Largely because 
people got to a point where they engaged the subject. Mm -hmm. So I would say, have an immersive experience with the subject. Spend some time. Take more pictures than you normally would. Stand on a table and look down. Climb a tree. Lay on the ground and look up. Experiment. Try different things. Yeah, that's great. And then, you know, and then that will give you a broader source of material as we start to apply that critical eye of editing of selection that we talked about, you know, a few minutes ago. That's a and great- And one, other, one, one mm -hmm. other word of advice. Try just for a few frames. Experiment with what we call shooting from the hip. Mm. Don't look through the viewfinder. So you see something and intuitively take a picture, take a picture, take a picture. You know, but use your intuition, but don't always be so labored at framing it precisely. Try what we call shooting from the hip. Yeah, that's good. I once heard it described as, you know, there, there's too many photos that are from the six foot guy with a camera to his eye perspective. Exactly. Precisely. <laughs> precisely. So excellent. Thank you for the time today, David. It's been fun chatting with you. I'm sure we could go on for another couple hours talking about these sorts of things. But uh, um, if folks are interested in learning more, as I said, I will, I will drop a link to your book, The Mindful Photographer, down below. Um, it's, uh, I enjoyed reading it. I feel like it's approachable by someone really regardless of what they normally photograph or where they're at in their photographic experience. You share your photographic experiences and your experiences in the classroom and in the world, um, you know, but it's not a, you know, uh, there's not a lot of prerequisites to this book, right? You don't have to know a certain type of photography. You don't have to no. know a thing in Photoshop. You just have to be a photographer who's interested in improving as a photographer. And I tried to write the book for everyone people that are just getting into photography to people that have been um, very engaged in photography. So thank you for your comments, Aaron. And, and I really appreciate the conversation and your willingness to have me on your show. Yeah. Thank you, David. I've enjoyed it. I enjoyed the book. Um, and for those of you watching once again, you know, hit that subscribe button down below. I will be back again next week with another topic uh, until then take care. Thank you, Aaron.